I'm Bill Korak of the Report Card, bringing truth to the classroom. We're at the First Conservative Church of Jacksonville, where Bridget Gabriel of Act for America is about to speak about radical Islamic subversion in American public schools. We join Randy McDaniels of Act for America in Jacksonville as he introduces Bridget Gabriel. What you will hear about is threats from those who want to promote Sharia Islamic law. This is not a First Amendment issue that we speak about, but a Sixth Amendment issue which says the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. And those who support Sharia want to replace the Constitution and make it the law of the land. And those groups that we're looking at, most of the major groups in America, like CARE, ISNA, NAIC, the Muslim Student Associations, and others, are in fact enemies of our Constitution that promote Sharia. And we know this from evidence entered into a trial, the largest successfully prosecuted Hamas financing trial in U.S. history. $12.4 million specifically go to the families of suicide bombers. And the groups that were listed there are the major mainstream groups that our government continues to work with in many cases. The implications of the Holy Land Foundation trial, trial proved three things. One, there was a subversive element in America that wants to replace our Constitution. Two, that it was a Muslim Brotherhood entity. And three, that the majority of the groups in America, as I just stated, were in fact those groups and part of it and are unindicted, are unindicted co conspirators in that list. We have groups like CARE working in schools. Right now we're fighting a battle down in Tampa. Three years this group has been speaking in schools, and CARE is one of the co conspirators, the largest, holy, uh, the largest terrorism finance case in U.S. history, and CARE members were sentenced to 65 years in prison. Three quotes, and this is one is from CARE member. Ibram Hooper, national spokesman for CARE, said, quote, I'm not going to tell you that I wouldn't like for the government of the United States to become Sharia in the future. I'm not going to do anything violent to promote it. I'm going to do it through education, meaning the schools. Rajit's going to be talking about some of this. Dawanet, they said public schools are fertile grounds where the seeds of Islam can be sowed in the hearts of non-Muslims. And Shabir Mansouri, the group that is the Council on Islamic Education, the primary group responsible for information in all textbooks across the nation, said, quote, I am waging a bloodless revolution in America's public schools, promoting world cultures and faiths. If you do not think that the enemy is going after the hearts and mind of your children, you're wrong, because that's where the cultural jihad is being waged. Thank you, and I look forward to speaking to you. The reason why I am so passionate about this subject is because it has affected my life personally. As you saw in the video, I was born and raised in <coughs> Lebanon, which used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. We were open-minded, we were fair, we were tolerant, we were multicultural. We prided ourselves on our multiculturalism. We had open border policy. We welcomed everyone into our country because we wanted to share with them the westernization which we had created in the heart of the Arabic world. Muslims used to send their children to study in our universities because we had built the best universities in the Arabic world. They graduated and worked in our economy because we had built the best economy in the Middle East. Beirut became known as Paris of the Middle East, the banking capital of the Middle East. And we didn't even have any oil. <laughs> we did, however, have brains. <laughs> and then, Everything started to change in my country. Once the Muslims became the majority, especially with the influx of the Palestinians out of Jordan, they declared war on the Christians. And they formed their own army called Jaish ibn al-Arabi, the Arabic Lebanese army. And they started killing the Christians. My 9-11 happened to me in 1975, when the radical Muslims blew up my home bringing it down, burying me under the rubble wounded, as they shouted, Allahu Akbar. My only crime 
was that I was a Christian living in a Christian town. I came to the United States and I thought I left it all behind me. I left the crazies over there. I met my American sweetheart in Israel. I married him. I came to the United States and I thought I'm going to start a new life in America. And I did. My husband and I had two children. We started our own little business in Virginia. And we were living the American dream until September 11th happened. And I remember watching the news on September 11th and the flashbacks that I had as I watched people being pulled from under the rubble, like my parents pulled me from under the rubble. People crying and wailing and screaming. I can remember my mother's screams, yelling my name, looking for me. I can smell the smoke as I watch the smoke on television. I know what that smells like. I know the smell of black powder. I know that smell of bombs. And I lay on my couch in my family room for six days. September 11th happened on a Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. And until Sunday, I was in my pajamas, debilitated, laying on my family room couch. It was flashback like a nightmare. And that's when I realized I need to make a difference. I cannot let this happen here. What the problem that we are facing in this country is that people in this country are too afraid to connect the dots. Because if they do connect the dots, they're going to have to do something about it. Yeah. Our elected officials are too afraid to discuss the situation. Our government failed to inform our people about what we are really dealing with immediately after September 11th. Everybody wanted to be politically correct. I mean, after all, we had elected officials speeding through red traffic lights just to get to the nearest mosques to tell the Muslim, it's not your fault. We know it's not your fault. <laughs> Instead of calling the Muslim community on the carpet and saying, how could you harbor 19 radicals within your community? Don't tell me you didn't know about it. I'm going to shed a light on tonight for you. And I'm going to start with an organization called the Muslim Brotherhood. It's an organization that you heard a lot about, especially after last January when, with the revolution in Egypt. Uh, not this January, but a year before that. You know, the Muslim Brotherhood, all the moderate Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is the oldest Islamic terrorist organization in the world, founded in 1928, and has 70 offshoot Islamic organizations, including Al-Qaeda and Hamas. Now, if the Muslim Brotherhood, if, if the Islamic world Al-Qaeda attacked us because of our foreign policy, because we are friends of Israel, then why was the Muslim Brotherhood founded in 1948? Israel wasn't even in existence. We had an, is an isolationist foreign policy back then. We were not in the Middle East. The Muslim Brotherhood was created to usher back the Islamic Caliphate, which had ended five years prior. The Muslim Brotherhood wrote a plan in 1982. It's a 100-year plan for radical Islam to infiltrate and dominate the West. In the counter-terrorism circles, this plan became known as the Project. <coughs> the plan was written in Europe, and if you look at Europe today, you see how far they have advanced in their plan in the last 30 years. They wrote another plan for the United States. The plan for the United States was written in 1991 on how to destroy the United States from within. <coughs> what makes the Muslim Brotherhood Project unique is it gives tactics and proposals as to how to infiltrate and dominate the West, how to use our open-mindedness against us, how to use our tolerance against us. They even give buzzwords on how you can do on, with Westerners, buzzwords that the West just gravitate towards. They talk about how to set up nonprofit organizations and human rights organizations and maintain the appearance of moderation in order to advance radical Islam in the West. But they don't call it radical Islam. That's actually a, a Western invention. They call it Islam. Uh, they talk about how to place Muslim interns at, at different levels of government on all countries, not only the United States, in all Western countries how to uh, work with like-minded progressive organizations that share similar goals. This is why when you look, for example, at the ACLU working with CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, you scratch your head and you think to yourself, how can these two organizations have anything in common? But the ACLU are used as the useful idiots yeah. in the hands of CARE. <laughs> In the United States, they wrote a plan in the United States in 1991 about the destruction of the United States. 
This plan was presented as evidence, here is the plan, was presented as evidence at the Holy Land Foundation trial, the largest ever anti-terrorism trial in the history of the United States. It was a terror financing trial where 108 guilty verdicts were handed down. The plan's title is Mudakkara Tafsiriya Lil Hadaf al-Istrategi Al-Aam Lil Jama'a Fi America Shamaliya, which means an explanatory memorandum for the strategic goal for the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States. Now, what makes this so important is that one paragraph I'm going to read to you out of this plan. And here's the paragraph. The process of settlement of the Muslim Brotherhood is a civilization jihadist process, which means a cultural process, with all the word <coughs> means. The Ikhwan, or the brothers, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and, quote, sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religion. That, number two on the list is the MSA, the Muslim Student Association. The Muslim Student Association today has more chapters on American college campus campuses than the Democrats and the Republicans combined. The Muslim Student Association was launched in the United States in 1963. So for those of you who think this is recent activity by radical Muslims, only now we are waking up to realizing what they have been doing in the United States. Number eight on the list is NATE, the North American Islamic Trust, which controls the majority of mosques in the United States. Number 22 on the list is IAP, Islamic Association for Palestine, which later became CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, and they have many others. We have 29. I just touched the tip of the iceberg to give you an idea as to what we are dealing with and what we are talking about. So, how did they plan? As you can see, the Muslim Brotherhood has a military arm and has a peaceful cultural arm. You know, a social arm, kind of, if you want to say. So we know they want to attack us militarily. That's Al-Qaeda, we know the terrorists, you know, the lone wolf and all of that stuff. But what is even more dangerous than that is the way they are taking our country and infiltrating our country from within with us being asleep at the switch. Part of the Muslim Brotherhood Project, they have educational foundations, they have media organizations, they have publishing organizations. They have decided, they have written in this plan every single way and every single loophole that they want to attack the United States in, and from the education, from the media. Do you know that right now they are setting up an entertainment center in Hollywood for $20 million? Is it any wonder why we see now more and more Hollywood becoming politically correct? You're not going to see any more movie, movies like Not Without My Daughter. Remember the movie Not Without My Daughter? You don't see movies like that anymore. That was 20 years ago. Those movies are not produced in Hollywood anymore. And there's a reason why. But what I'm going to focus on right now is how they are infiltrating our education system. Because this is how we are losing our children. They started on college campus, infiltrating the college campus with the flow, with the flow from Saudi money. Because of the oil wealth, the Saudis started pumping millions into our universities, setting up Middle East study departments and political science departments, and appointing Arab professors who are anti-Israel and anti-America to brainwash our kids to make them believe America is bad, Israel is evil, and uh, you know the, the Islamic world is, is uh, repressed and is oppressed because of America's imperialism. And the way they were doing it is they were using a loophole called Title VI program. Title VI program is a program instituted by our government after World War II in order to teach our children about foreign governments and foreign language so they may be an asset to our country, especially those who want to get into the State Department, the diplomatic field, go work in embassies, the CIA. That's what that program was all about, the Title VI program. So under the Title VI program, that's how the Saudis started funneling billions of dollars setting up these departments and appointing Arab professors who are brainwashing our children. To give you an idea of the Saudi infiltration into our universities, here's a list of the extent of their infiltration. 
Can Fahad of Saudi Arabia donated $20 million to set up a Middle East study department at the University of Arkansas. Five million donated to, Mid to Berkeley's Middle East study department from two Saudi sheikhs led to Al-Qaeda. Harvard received 22.5 million. Is it any wonder why Harvard invites President Khatibi E to speak at Harvard on September 11th, two years ago? Money buys a lot of influence. 28.1 million went to Georgetown. 11 million to Cornell. 5 million to MIT. 1.5 billion to Texas A&M. 1 million to Princeton. Rutgers received 5 million share endowment also, Colombia did receive that as well, but Colombia tried to lie to conceal the source of the funds. Other recipients of Saudi monies include UC Santa Barbara, John Hopkins University, Rice University, American University, University of Chicago, USC, UCLA, Duke University, Syracuse University, Howard University. You get the idea. From the Ivy Leagues down to the community colleges and everything in between, we pump the gas and they pump poison into the hearts and minds of our future generation. And that's why we must become energy and So, the Islamists figured out the strategy worked so well on college campus, they figured, why wait until the kids get to college? Why don't we start with the children in middle school? This way, by the time they get to be 18 years old and go to college and they can vote, we already have them in our pocket. So the Islamic Council on Education, which later changed names like four or five times already, I do not know, I can't remember what their last name is, they started with an Islam course, and it's an Islam course to sixth and seventh graders in public schools. The course is three weeks long, where Muslim students have to memorize and recite verses from the Quran, adopt Islamic names, uh, go fast for one day to experience Ramadan or the Islamic holy holiday, and go to a mosque on a field trip. And you know, when I started speaking about this as I, as I would travel, people would say, absolutely not. Brigitte, you're exaggerating. I mean, you know, we have separation of church and state. I mean, after all, we can't even sing Christmas carols at school. We don't even have Christmas holiday. We have winter break. You know, they couldn't possibly be teaching this type of stuff. So I thought, you know what? There is nothing like show and tell. <laughs> so here is the course. This is the Islam course. And um, the Islam course starts with, here's the teacher instructions. The teacher begins the class with, from the beginning you and your classmates will become Muslims. You will be a member of a caravan. And she <coughs> continues on with the explanation of the course. And she continues, and you can tell I'm skipping through a lot of stuff saving you time. I'm boredom. <laughs> Dressing as, Mus as a Muslim and trying to be involved will increase your learning and enjoyment. Finally, trying your best at all tasks will guarantee you an excellent grade and a more enjoyable time. So the teacher is already dangling the grade carrot in front of the children. Um, and then here on the next page, they give them a choice of Islamic names. Here is the page you can choose um, Muslim names from. Abdullah, Khalid, Hassan, Hamza, Ibrahim, Arafat, Karima, Maryam, Noor, Amina, etc. They have girls' names and boys' names. And then, here's a wisdom card. Now, I chose this card. This is like a practice card, you know, like when kids are studying math. And, you know, you have cue cards, so you can memorize your lesson. They have them, you know, in all subjects. So this is called a wisdom card. And what I'm going to share with you today is a card about jihad. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this specific card with you is because we have become familiar with the word jihad because we hear terrorists use it a lot. I mean, after all, they have organizations named Islamic Jihad, Al-Mujahideen. Every time you watch a video of a suicide bomber that he pre-taped before he blew himself up, he talks about why he's dying, Fi Sabil al-Jihad, in the path of Jihad, or Jihad Fi Sabil Allah, Jihad in the path of Allah. So the word Jihad is basically one with terrorist activity. So here's what they're teaching our children about jihad. And by the way, jihad is mentioned in the Quran 40 times. 36 times out of 40 as a military struggle, a holy war against the infidels in order to either kill them or subjugate them. Here's what they're teaching our children about jihad. A jihad is a struggle by Muslims against oppression, invasion, and injustice. So, 
If these words sound familiar to you, it's because these are the talking points of Al-Qaeda. Every time you hear Al-Qaeda issuing press release about why they're fighting the United States, what do they say? We are fighting against American oppression. We are fighting against injustice. We are fighting against uh, invasion. You hear that from Hamas in particular, the Palestinian Authority. Why suicide bombers and Hamas and all those Palestinians, you know, blowing themselves up? We are fighting oppression. We are fighting injustice. We are fighting occupation. So what we are seeing in public schools today is basically the talking points of our enemies being fed to our sixth and seventh graders in the name of diversity and multiculturalism, teaching them about religion, that are the talking points of our enemy paid for by our tax dollars in our public schools. This is what's happening in our public school system. This is unbelievable what is happening, that we have allowed it to get to this point. Parents were not paying attention because parents asked little Johnny and little Sally when they come home, came home from school, oh honey, did you do your homework? Oh sure mom, I'm finished, I can go play now. That's the extent of it. You have parents working two jobs, not paying attention to what's happening in the public schools. A lot of these courses, this is a state uh, education curriculum. This is a state approved education. And this is why we are so concerned about what's happening in the country. This is why we need to develop the backbone to say what needs to be said and throw political correctness in the garbage. Yeah.